In the post-apocalyptic world, leisurely and picturesque scenes were rare. At the moment, Grace is enjoying the serenity of nature, hearing a sound. Grace opened her eyes to see a zombie lunging at her. She struggled to prevent the zombie from biting her and finally managed to break its arm, giving herself a chance to breathe. Just then, a stick pierced through the zombie's head, pushing the creature away and gasping for air. Grace saw a young girl with a long stick, standing up. Grace realized her pregnant belly was gone. Was this all a dream? Or was she dreaming now? As more zombies approached from a distance, the girl told Grace not to move assuring her she could handle it. The girl faced the zombies without panic, wielding her long stick with ease. Grace watched, puzzled, as her skill with the stick was strikingly similar to Morgan's. The zombies stood no chance against her. The girl, named Athena, helped Grace up and revealed that her father had taught her these skills. She was planning to take Grace back to their base for a medical checkup. They walked through a path lined with pink plants, which looked particularly warm and inviting. When they arrived at the girl's home, Grace realized it was the dam. Curious. Grace asked the girl how old she was. Athena replied. I'm 16 this year. I've been here since I was born. Grace was puzzled. As the dam was only built a few months ago. Looking around, she noticed significant differences from before. The only unchanged item was the axe Morgan had left there. Now rusted, Grace couldn't help but reminisce about her moments with Morgan. Then she saw Athena's father, Morgan, with white hair. Grace excitedly called out to Morgan. Morgan, not recognizing Grace at that moment, still led her into the dam. The dam had improved a lot, now housing livestock and various crops. Grace revealed her identity to Morgan, whose expression turned serious. Grace had to reveal a secret only known to them. Although Morgan was still confused, he was convinced that she was Grace. And then he showed Grace her grave. Morgan revealed that he had personally buried her. Grace curiously asked how she had died. Morgan explained, childbirth weakened you and the radiation you had been exposed to was beyond belief. It was clear Athena was her child, but Grace chose not to acknowledge their relationship. The whole situation was bewildering. Morgan, unsure why another Grace had appeared, tried to accept it. Grace then saw Naomi, now nearly 60, self-trained as a doctor, with her apprentice Charlie. However, they didn't recognize the current Grace. And of course there was Daniel in his 70s who was cutting Victor's hair and it looked like they had made up. Dwight appeared next with his mischievous son and wife, who held their daughter. Sherry had let go of her past grievances to live happily with Dwight. Morgan mentioned Alicia had returned to the initial stadium, and Althea was out searching for her girlfriend. Everyone seemed to be leading the life Grace had always hoped for. Morgan then wanted to take the mother and daughter for a walk, even though Athena didn't know about their relationship. As they walked, a car appeared ahead with the word end written on it. Grace felt an eerie familiarity with the vehicle, as if remembering something. In her excitement, she touched the car's door handle, triggering an explosion that hurled Grace away. In the coma Grace's mind floated a lot of scenes also heard Morgan has been calling her. When she awoke, Morgan was gone, and zombies were approaching, but Athena remained. They quickly left the area, with Morgan's calls still echoing, heard only by Grace. She responded to the sky, informing him of their location, but his calls persisted. Grace, looking at the zombies, remembered what had happened. She was about to give birth. And the only medical help, Naomi, was kilometers away. Morgan was taking her to Naomi's hospital when the car exploded in reality. She realized she must be in a coma, with Morgan continuously calling out to her. Indeed, at this moment, Grace was unconscious, able to hear Morgan's calls but unable to wake up. Morgan pleaded, I need you to wake up and have the baby, please, Grace, wake up. Outside, numerous zombies had gathered. The explosion wasn't an accident, but the work of a mysterious group. Morgan reached for his walkie-talkie to contact Naomi, informing her they were at the veterinary station by the 28-kilometer marker, but Naomi said she was still five hours away. Their only hope now was to get Grace to wake up, as the child was also in danger. In her dream, Grace was equally anxious, hearing Naomi's words. She thought that reaching the veterinary station in her dream might wake her up. As she neared the station, Morgan's voice became clearer. Confirming her theory, she believed that once she reached there, she would wake up. Just then, Grace suddenly fell to the ground in pain, and Athena displayed similar symptoms. This was due to Morgan moving Grace in the real world. Fortunately, Morgan found a safe place to stop. Grace pulled Athena up and she felt the same way she did. Even though it was a dream, the feeling of mother and son connecting transcended time and space. And in the dream she was a real person. Grace explained the situation to Athena. 
I need to wake up for you to be born. On their way, they encountered a white horse, bringing joy even in the dreamlike setting. In reality, the people outside seemed to have discovered their position and Morgan had to go out to fight. In the dream, Grace reached the veterinary station. Five men confronted Morgan. Morgan warned, you should turn around and leave now. Jason says give us your keys and we'll be fine. We've been looking for you for a long time. Unintimidated, Morgan replied, leave now or meet the same fate as the last two. Jason insisted the keys could change everything. Seeing Jason unheeding, Morgan prepared for a fight. Jason was going to fight himself, but he was stopped by his man, who thought it would be easy for them to fight five against one. But the situation unfolded in unexpected ways. Originally, Morgan intended only to injure them, not to kill, but when they refused to back down, he had no choice but to comply with their persistence. It took him just two minutes to deal with four of them. The remaining one, Jason, showed no sign of surrender, but Morgan swiftly pierced his chest with a single move. Jason's injury wasn't fatal, and he chose to flee. At this time, Grace had stopped breathing, and Morgan desperately performed chest compressions. In the dream, Athena was surrounded by zombies while Grace lay weak on the ground. In the final moments, an older Morgan arrived. He helped Grace to her feet. In front of them was a door of light. Stepping through it would awaken Grace. As much as she hates to leave her 16-year-old daughter, the real world Morgan is waiting for her. After stepping through the light, Grace in the real world finally woke up. I'm going to have a daughter. Grace exclaimed joyfully. Morgan decided to name her Athena, as Grace had been calling out this name in her coma. As Grace and Morgan discussed the dream, a car noise came from outside. The next thing you know, a car comes crashing in, and the man who comes down is Jason. Jason, armed with a gun, crashed into the place, aiming for the key around Morgan's neck. For the sake of Grace's safety, although he didn't know what they wanted the key for, Morgan still gave it to Jason. Thankfully, Jason kept his word and left in his car. Unable to wait for Naomi to arrive for the delivery, Morgan took on the task. After hours of struggle, the child was finally born, but Morgan's smile froze. Grace sensed something was wrong, the baby wasn't crying, she kept calling out to Morgan, with no other option. Morgan turned around, holding the baby, Grace took the baby, expecting her to be like Athena from her dream, only to face a tragic outcome, though not Morgan's child. The loss of a new life deeply pained him. <laughs> Alicia was captured by the mysterious group while covering for Althea and others during their retreat. Their leader, Teddy admired Alicia and planned to persuade her to join him. Meanwhile, they dispatched Jason to seize the key Morgan had obtained, inadvertently involving Grace. Additionally, due to the long distance traveled by Naomi, the medical personnel, Grace's child was born without breath. The next day, concerned Naomi arrived at the dam to check on Grace, but Morgan stopped her. Morgan said that Grace had locked herself in the church, praying daily. She felt that her child bore her sins. Morgan was also angry. Wondering if things would have been different if Naomi had stayed at the dam. He wouldn't allow Naomi in now. Arguing her presence would only upset Grace. Morgan believed Naomi's visit was more about alleviating her own guilt than helping Grace. Obviously, Morgan's words hurt Naomi's heart. And she could only turn around and leave. After leaving, Naomi didn't go back to the hospital. But went to the original oil field. There, she found the same message spray painted. The end is the beginning. Naomi wanted to find clues from the place where the mysterious man appeared. She was going to avenge Grace in her own way and to prevent more people from being hurt. She then remembered a letter from John she had never read, fearing it would overwhelm her with sadness. At that moment, Dwight arrived, concerned about Naomi, who had recently dealt with John's loss and now Grace's child's death. Dwight felt that Naomi must have felt very sorry for herself and that he was worried about her. Dwight was grateful to John and Naomi for their support during his most challenging times. Without them, he feared he might have lost his will to live. Naomi felt deeply guilty, thinking if she hadn't saved Virginia at the oil fields, John might still be alive. Sherry, Dwight's wife, also arrived at the scene, hoping to find some gasoline. At that moment, Naomi asked, Did you bring anyone else with you? They quickly took cover behind the car. It seemed they had encountered an attack, possibly from one of the mysterious group members. Naomi, undaunted and even excited, told Sherry they should try to capture the attacker alive, as he might have valuable information. She then kicked off the car's rearview mirror to try to spot the attacker, underestimating the man's shooting skills. Sherry could not care less about capturing him alive. 
She took out her pistol and fired three shots to scare the man away. The gunfire attracted several zombies towards them. Naomi instructed them to stay and fight off the zombies while she checked if the man was dead or alive. She was keen to find out the location of the mysterious group to prevent further harm. Upon reaching the spot, the man was gone, but a bus was parked there, likely belonging to their attacker. Naomi approached the bus cautiously, but the door was locked and she couldn't open it, so she had to force the window to break. She puts her clothes on the window. Naomi wants to go in and see if she can find any clues. Inside, she found a hand-cranked spotlight and discovered a map on the bus wall with photos of the spray-painted slogans. The photos indicated the attacker had visited many locations marked with the slogans, suggesting a deep connection with the group. Suddenly, she heard the sound of a gun being cocked and turned to find the old man who had attacked them. He questioned her presence and affiliation with the spray painters. Naomi realizes that this man is not part of that organization and suggests that they could join forces against them. The old man just said that you and your companion should leave. These people are very perverted and not something that you can imagine. Naomi, fearless, was more interested in the information the old man had. He revealed that since a garage fire, he hadn't been able to locate them. Warning that if they discovered Naomi's group searching for them, they'd quickly execute their plan. Without disclosing the plan, the man, who had been tracking the group for a long time, refused to share more information. In order to get some information from the old man, Naomi said there's one more place you missed on this map. The man, uninterested in exchanging information, instead ordered Naomi at gunpoint to drive him somewhere. With no choice, Naomi had to leave Dwight and Sherry behind. Looking at the old man pointing a gun at her, Naomi said that it's not necessary, I want to deal with them as much as you do. The stubborn old man wasn't buying it, so Naomi took a risky move, suddenly swerving the car, causing him to lose his balance. The car skidded for 20 meters before stopping at the roadside. Seizing the opportunity, Naomi drew her gun on the old man. At the sight of the pistol, the old man froze for a moment. Then he asked Naomi where she got the pistol from. Naomi retorted, asking why she should tell him. He revealed the gun was his identified by the initials JD on the handle, his name being John Dory. Naomi realized this was John's father, who had left when John was very young, so much so that John thought he was dead. Naomi's manner and tone of voice began to change for the better. Dory was her husband's father after all. Naomi asked him why he didn't ask John where he was and how he'd spent the last 40 years. Dory said he already knew the answer. Naomi's presence there, her sorrowful expression, John's service gun with her, and the two wedding rings she wore, as a former police officer, he could put these clues together. Naomi then realized she had left her coat on the bus window. When she checked, the coat, containing John's letter, was gone, likely fallen onto the road. She wanted to go back for it, but Dory refused to waste gasoline. Naomi tried to start the car in protest, but it wouldn't move. Upon inspection, she realized that they had accidentally run over a zombie, getting it stuck under the car. Naomi learned some secrets from Dory. When Dory was a police officer, a pastor named Teddy went mad and committed murder. To incarcerate Teddy, Dory resorted to framing him. Since the 70s, Teddy had been preaching the idea that the end is the beginning. A few months ago, he was out looking for food and found this message spray-painted elsewhere. He rushed back to the prison hoping to find Teddy's body. However, Teddy's cell was open, indicating he was causing trouble again in this post-apocalyptic world. Dory used dishonorable methods to capture Teddy, and although hailed as a hero, he couldn't face himself for it. He chose to leave John and his mother, too ashamed to see them or visit their cabin again. Naomi then remembered something about that cabin. After Virginia's death, her henchman Hill disappeared, likely hiding there. John's other pistol is still in Hill's possession and he may know more about the organization. They decided to walk to the cabin. Shortly after they left, Dwight and Sherry, who had tracked them, found the bus. They see the photo on the wall and realize that the old man who shot at them is John's father. So they're most likely heading to the cabin. Sherry marveled at the twists of fate. Dwight reflected on how he had once attacked John. But John not only helped him later but also led him back to Sherry, a true wonder of fate.